Hello, everyone. Welcome to another virtual event with Mysterious Galaxy. I am Nick, the director of events for the store. <laughs> we have three wonderful authors here, which you, I'm, I'm pretty sure on your end of things, can't see the three authors because my big head's here, but I'll disappear shortly, so don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> we have Dr. Steven Novella, Bob Novella, and Jay Novella. Hello, gentlemen. Hello. Hey, thanks for having us here, man. <laughs> yeah. See? I'm pretty sure he couldn't multiply his voice. There's three gentlemen there, I swear. <laughs> Today, we are here to celebrate the release of their latest joint efforts, The Skeptic's Guide to the Future. Why yesterday's science and science fiction tells us about the world of tomorrow. And as a genre fiction store, like I tell, uh, was telling these gentlemen, it made sense just to have it with us. Um, if you haven't yet pre-ordered or bought your copy of The Skeptic's Guide, what are you waiting for? But Good news is, if you click the link below, they'll take you to our website. You can get your own copy. Uh, we ship across the country as well as outside of the country. And while supplies last, we do have some signed book plates by these three authors. So you can I remember that copy. one. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Steven Novella is, is an academic clinical neurologist at Yale University School of Medicine and is the host and producer of The Skeptic's Guide to the Universe, also known as SGU. He also co-hosts Alpha Quadrant 6, a science fiction review show. Bob Novella, I'm going to disappear for this section so all three gentlemen can be there. There we go. Bob Novella is a co-host of SGU and also blogs for SGU's Rogues Gallery. Bob is founder and vice president of New England Skeptical Society. He has written numerous articles that are widely published in skeptical literature and is a frequent guest on science and technology podcasts. Last but not least, we have Jay Novella, a co-host of the SGU podcast, chief operations officer at SGU Productions, and serves on the board of directors for Northeast Conference on Science and Skepticism. All right. So now that I am in disembodied voice, I am going to disappear even in voice to leave it to these three, but I'll be back later in the program to take some of your questions. Don't forget, if you have any questions that you would like to ask these three, click another link below. This is ask a question, submit them, and I will get to them later. All right, for now, goodbye. All right, thanks. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Uh, you know, we are always so excited to talk about this new book. The, the three of us had so much fun doing the research and and writing it. You know, these are these are things we've been researching for decades. Actually, we've been in love with the idea of the future, of futurism, of science fiction and science and technology. This is kind of the intersection of all of those things. And so, what we try to do in this book is to take a skeptical look, you know, or a hard, critical thinking look at futurism itself, just as an endeavor. And uh, at the, our, you know, our current technology and emerging technologies and see if we can extrapolate a little bit into the future and then maybe think uh, about, you know, the how these technologies might mature even into the distant future. And we also take a look at, you know, the, the most common uh, science sci-fi technologies and talk about whether or not we'll ever get to see those kind that kind of tech is it scientifically plausible is it breaking the laws of physics you know uh, what kind of versions of that technology might emerge um, you guys have a favorite chapter you want to delve into jay um yeah that's a complicated question because <laughs> they're, all, I, they're all favorites i have I, have, I guess the one that I learned the most about is quantum computing. We've, yeah. we've talked heavily about this in the past. I, I didn't I didn't realize how I had absolutely no idea what quantum quantum computing was. And now I have a little bit better idea because it's fantastically complicated. <laughs> right. So I really appreciated that. And, and there's a lot of things about quantum computing that go along with it that I didn't I didn't know, like the whole thing. Yeah. And the other chapter that I absolutely loved was really doing a deep dive on artificial intelligence because mm -hmm. that's another topic that I thought I knew what was going on. And then when we did all the research, I'm like, nope, I really was the skin of the apple yeah. on that Yeah, one. There's always layers and you can always go a layer or two deeper if you, you know, spend a lot of time. The quantum computing chapter is interesting. So in, you know, in a nutshell, quantum computers use qubits, quantum bits, instead of ordinary bits in, to do their calculations. The difference is a qubit it's not a zero or a one. It's anywhere between zero and one inclusive. And that means that it's just, you know, for certain types of, of uh, calculations, it's just exponentially more powerful than a traditional computer. But it also is a really good representation of futurism because 
it's so challenging to predict the future of quantum computers. The potential is massive, mm. but the hurdles between where we are now and a really mature functioning quantum computer are still substantial. It's possible that we may never really, you know, crack the code of how to get to like a million qubit to a quantum computer or greater. With very little, with very low error, you know, error, yeah, the, error the, correction. The, the, the error correction That's is critical still as well. an issue and the interconnectivity is still an but issue. But it feels like we're going to get there. It does, but you know, but you know, you don't know until you get there. Uh, it's also, you know, one of those chapters, um, you know, when, when we're writing about the emerging technologies, especially where uh, like there's news items relevant to the chapter coming out all the time. Yeah. And at some point, our editor had to like cut us off and say, stop sending us updates. You just it, it is what it is. Because uh -huh. then, then like a week later, like another news item would come out. Oh, they just cracked a little bit further into the, you know, the quantum computing you know, puzzle. But we can't update the book any further. Right. Um, obviously, the future is a never ending story, right? It's not like it's never done. So, the, but the big one with that was fusion. So we wrote a chapter yeah. on fusion energy. Also, this is in oh, the yeah, section yeah. of the book where it's like the uh, technologies that don't exist yet, but may exist soon. And, you know, fusion power would obviously be huge. You know, you're just uh, fusing hydrogen into helium and making a ton of energy with no, you know, no radioactive waste, much no cleaner, carbon waste. Much cleaner yeah, it's, than clean, fission. It's, it's efficient. It's just really hard to do. We, we've been working on it for decades. Seven the years 80 years yeah. we're getting to and yeah but we're really we're really making some damn strides well the big the Congress, big joke but, yeah the big yeah. joke for many years was like fusion technology is 50 years away and it will always be because it always or, seemed or to be moving away as we are as we approach it but you could absolutely argue in the past five to ten years we are making we're making bona fide you know advances yeah imp incremental but but important ones and getting closer and closer to that goal in a very demonstrative we're, we're way. We're burning plasma, right? I mean, yes, there's a couple it's... different methods they've achieved burning, meaning that there is, at least even if it's for a moment, that they've actually is, they had produced connection. fusion yeah. that, that actually sustained right. itself for a bit. Well, you but know what, but we haven't gotten to the point where the whole process produces more energy than you put in. Right. Obviously, that's where that's the ultimate goal, is that you're getting right. energy out and of the system. And even if we reach that, that doesn't mean uh, a commercial reactor is right around the corner. Even that could, could take many years before we really mm -hmm. have commercial reactors proliferating everywhere. Or, or maybe it just wouldn't be worth it because it's too expensive or whatever, and then solar yeah. takes off, because you never well, really not, know where it's going to go. That's a good point, because researching all of this all of these different technologies that we 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 follow basically in the news anyway you know we're always yeah. reading all about all this stuff but really really building up um, a, a bank of data on each one of these and being able to have that in your head as we're talking about other stuff it was it was more interesting because we had so much information on tap like the solar thing you just said yeah knowing about where solar uh where solar panels are yeah. and how efficient they are now and how they're going to be extraordinarily more efficient that might mean we don't need a fusion reactor yeah but you also have to throw in battery or grid storage because you know the sun's only shining part of the year and part of the part of the day um you know i have solar panels on my roof and they don't produce much electricity in january you know even on a even on a sunny day so now you're talking about shifting energy not only from day to night, but from summer to winter, and so we'll turn the fusion reactors on at night. Well, I just think there's there's a role <laughs> for just on demand massive amounts of energy. I agree. Um, right. But again, you know, what's the grid going to look like in 50 years? There's a lot of parallel questions. You can't just look at one technology in isolation. You have to look at how all technologies are advancing. Um, but then, you know, again, the fusion power is a good representation for a couple of things we get into in the book. Like, for example. Um, it, it, it's not hard to say that eventually we'll have fusion power, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that's actually a pretty easy, yeah. you know, high confident prediction. Uh, but exactly when is it going to cross that line where it's going to be commercially viable at scale? It's harder to say. And, and rolled out, like and it, rolled out, and then and you know, they'll have that one fusion reactor that's doing it. But then they're like, okay, we know how to build one now. Now let's build them in fifty places around right, the planet. Right, you right. Know? So, like for example, the nineteen fifties, a lot of people thought that we would be running the world on fission power right now and you know what is it worldwide we're about 15 percent uh why isn't it 80 percent why isn't it 100 percent because people don't want it you know because there are, there are other issues that and this gets to the 
the parts of the book where we're talking about futurism itself, you know, how do we think about the future? Uh, it's not just about superior technology winning, right? It, it, there's so Betamax. many other things. There's, there's so many different, what makes a technology superior? There's, yeah. there's aesthetics, you know, cost, safety, environmental impact, convenience, Pure uh, perception. Yeah, just perception, perception, ideology, you know, and, misinformation. And it, sometimes it comes down to one person making a decision. Quirky historical things happen, disasters, the Hindenburg blowing up, Ford deciding whether to push gasoline or electricity as his first mass-produced car. So there's all these, these quirky things that go in there. And so even when you could say this technology is plausible and it's being developed and we'll probably get the technology to do it, that doesn't mean we're going to make the choice yeah. to do it yeah. or that we're going to choose it over other options at the time or how much of a, of a role it's going to play or what, what niche it's going to fill. But also with the fusion chapter, I just can't forget this. Like after the editor cut us off for, for updates, yeah, we yeah. learned about a item. Yeah, yeah, an entirely new approach to fusion, which is you know that we didn't think of, and that pissed you off. So well, much. I was like, you know, <laughs> Steve was like, I, well, how can we not put this in the book? This We're already outdated. Got to be second edition, I yeah. guess. But where you know they don't even try to burn plasma; they're like, "We're just going to have a fusion explosion and then just do it over and over again." And they use the cavitation, you know, to get just a a temporary microsecond, whatever. Fusion so event it's not a continuous fusion reaction. It's yeah. little. It's like they drop a bead of it in, they ignite it, and it does like a, it pops like a firecracker. They collect the energy from that real quick, and they do it over and over and over. Yeah, and over. all you need is heat. You just need to put out lots of heat. So, and, I, and when I, when I and read the study, Bob and I were talking about like, uh, yeah, that kind of makes a lot of sense. Yeah. You know? But which is another sort of principle of futurism, like one of the big reasons why it's hard to, you know, the future technology is hard to predict. One is people make choices. We don't necessarily know what choices they're going to make. It's not just about the technology. The other one is disruptive technologies. People are clever. We, we think of ways to do things that we didn't think of before. And, you know, in order to, when you think about it this way, in order to really accurately predict the future, you need to predict the output of a million genuses over a hundred years. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. You can't do it. You you know there there are other people out there who have areas of expertise you don't have who are smarter than you or whatever. All, and some of them are going to come up with ideas that no one's thinking of right now, and they're going to be disruptive and they're going to render all prior observations obsolete. Right. It's too yeah. chaotic. It's like it's like predicting the weather. You can you can predict climate just the broad the broad, broad strokes into the future, yeah. but to, to get down to the nitty gritty details, the farther out you go, like weather prediction, it becomes inherently unpredictable. You, you can never have any really high confidence about yeah. detailed predictions about the future. There's the interplay of decisions and culture and people and technology is just too great to, to, to predict. Yeah. If anybody says they can predict accurately deep into the future like that, they are absolutely wrong. They're a charlatan. And it's right. also impossible to predict things like someone becoming a billionaire. Yeah. Like, you know, like take Elon Musk, for example, like you know, he became a billionaire for very specific reasons with, with businesses that he was involved in in the past. And he could have just as easily not become a billionaire and then not bought Tesla and bought SpaceX and done what he did right. with those two companies, which happened to be leaders in technology right now. Right. And yeah. So that's one of the things that nobody predicted, right? Like nobody in the 70s was saying, oh, yeah, in 20 years, we're going to have tech billionaires may, who make their money on websites. On what? Yeah. They, yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. That, like that wasn't anticipated. Uh, you know, I think the biggest thing that wasn't anticipated was the analog to digital revolution, which again rendered all pre digital science fiction and predictions obsolete and quaint now, like laughable. Um, we, in, in the book, we, we elucidate various uh, futurism fallacies, right? So these are common tropes or common mistakes that futurists make. And one of them is what what we call the steampunk fallacy. So steampunk, you know, is an aesthetic where you have sort of Victorian age steam technology that then progresses um, indefinitely into the future, getting more and more elaborate, you know, more and more complicated, but never, but without the introduction of any new disruptive technologies, no electronics, right. no nuclear power, no digital power, no computers. So you just have really tweaked out advanced steam technology. Uh, but that's how people predict the future. Right. You know, they generally take yeah. the existing technology and they just extrapolate it more and more and more into the future. And now, there in, that that you know that idea of like steampunk, you can translate to any era of technology. Like there's something called the 
cassette punk, which is like 1970s <laughs> right. technology, but very advanced, you know, um, or more complicated, more elaborate, but still it's, you know, analog. It's, right. It's fun to look at, yeah. but not realistic. It's electronic, uh, but it's, but it's not digital. And yeah. I think, you know, the, the section where we go over all the different ways that futurists make mistakes, you know, yeah. where they, where they keep tripping up on themselves. It's interesting because I don't think anyone's ever really put that list together before. I think you, I couldn't find one. No, yeah, you came up with that list. And I, and I, when I, you know, I just uh, got the book on audible because I want the, I didn't hear you read the book. Yeah. And I wanted to hear, you know, hear the way that you're reading it and I'm listening to it. And it, I got through those chapters and I'm like, man, this is like, if you follow, you know, if you don't let yourself fall into these thinking pit traps, mm -hmm. you know, pitfalls, you, you might be able to predict the future a little bit better if you stay away from yeah, it. Sure, and, better and, for sure, I would and, say. And part of that is not trying to really predict the future yeah. at all. We're, you know, Obviously, we do in very broad brushstroke, but really what we're talking about in the book is not what's going to happen. It's just it's, reasonable extrapolation. It's what might happen depending on the choices that people make and depending on how some of the chips fall. Um, sometimes, they're, you know, but when we, especially when we talk about the science fiction technology, like we talk about, are we ever going to have anti-gravity, let's say? No. It turns out, well, probably no, but it turns out that we can't definitively answer that question until we solve the, the problem of quantum gravity. Like we, until we unify quantum mechanics and general relativity, we can't give a final definitive answer to that question. So by definition, we don't know what the outcome of future research is going to be, what future science is going right. to be. So we have to say, well, if if it turns out that you know gravity has these properties, you know there could be anti gravity, then yeah, then it, it's it's possible. If it turns out as you know, physics, it seems like the physics is going in the direction that no, yeah. it, it's probably not going but, to be possible. But, but we don't know for sure. But we don't, don't let Steve. Sure get your hopes up yeah. <laughs> with anti-gravity because that really, really looks like it's not going to happen. Right. Gravity has one charge and that charge is mass energy. That's it. It's not like ele electrical force that's positive and negative and you could use negative to shield against pot. That's not going to happen. Gravity doesn't have it. You would have to fundamentally change the nature of gravity to create anti-gravity. So that's really um, not going to happen. Unless there's a deeper aspect to reality that we don't imagine yet until we solve the, the Bob, whole quantum right. gravity. Right. Was... Steve is an anti-gravity truther. <laughs> <laughs> it's just... But that's just an example, right, of where right. We're, we're, we're at the limits of what we know to be, you know, the nature of, of reality, the, the laws of physics. Um, other laws of physics, like thermodynamics, yeah, it's not going anywhere. But here's another right. good example. Um, you remember pretty much for, you know, my entire adult scientifically literate life, you know, there was this this rule, uh, this principle of the the uh, diffraction limit, right? Like yeah, you can't yeah. image something smaller than the wavelength of light you're using to image it. Yeah. Right? That's just a law of physics, a fact. And it's just impossible. It makes sense, right? And it makes perfect sense. And But now suddenly it is possible, right? Because there's metamaterials that can manipulate things. You know, it has properties that nobody knew existed because the properties aren't inherent to the material they derive from the nanostructure of the material yeah. is one way to think about it. configuration of the material. and then suddenly the diffraction limit went away and we can get through that problem with something that nobody was talking about even 20 years ago or maybe they you know but it, that's the technology always has always had deeper roots than you think but the bottom line is there was a time before anyone even conceived of metamaterials and when now we have metamaterials and we have to change some things that we thought were immutable laws or reword them to be more in inclusive like yes. kind of like right kind of like uh, einstein's relativity versus yeah. the newtonian but those are the best yeah. that, that's that, that's what makes science so unbelievably interesting first right. like you know that you could have the law and people will still work on it. Yeah. They're still testing the limits and still seeing if they can push. People forward. are damn clever. That's the other. Right. There are people out there that are, and they, and not only are they super clever, but they might spend their entire life working on one little problem. Yeah. And, you know, it's just hard to account for what they might come up with. The disruptive technology thing is the wild card in trying to think about the future. But the thing is, even if there is disruptive technologies, we're still, there are certain things that are, we could still say with high confidence. Battery technology is progressing pretty much, you know, linearly. 
solar battery panels, technology. Yeah, yeah, battery yeah. technology, solar panel technology, but you computer could, power. Right. These things are predictably progressing. Yes, but you could also say that battery technology will, I think it's pr pretty well determined that it will never be as energy dense as say a, a gasoline. It's just not inherent in battery technology to have the energy density of something like gasoline. But I, but I disagree with that. That's, I think that's one of those diffraction laws where until somebody figures out a way to do it. Um, yeah, right? Bob, do we need it to be though? That's the thing. Like, you know, right now with cars, we, we want cars to be, you know, the best batteries out there given say like 350 right. miles of range. Right. Mm -hmm. If we, if we break 400 or break, you know, 450, we're getting into a, a zone where yeah. do they really oh, yeah. need to get better for cars. Actually, there was but, an analysis that said that 280 is probably the sweet spot. Yeah. Like we're right. already past the sweet spot of what electric vehicles need. Yeah. So you know, if battery technology gets to a certain point where it can do grid storage well. Yeah. Then, yeah. Then that's not going to be a problem, but there are physical limits to, to battery technology. Sure. And that, until you figure out a way around them. Uh, but there are some limits to physics which are absolute, and others which I right. see as relative. A, a little squishy. Yeah. yeah, they're a little they're squishy. A little but squishier. That's you're pissing Bob off. <laughs> <laughs> we don't agree on everything. You know, we there are some chapters like where we yeah we had, had to, go back to have and a forth. discussion about yeah. where are we going to land in terms of what we say is the most yeah. likely thing. And then eventually, and then eventually he saw my way, and you know it was, it was good. <laughs> yeah, but those discussions were great. I mean, when we were when we were hashing it out. Like even just coming up with the list of things that we're going to talk about, that, that was magical. You know, that, yeah, that yeah. was like, uh, so, all right, guys, the whole world is there of technology. Like, let's go through the list. Right. Let's make the list. That was really cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that list came out so fast, faster than it took for us to decide who was going to research what. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Oh, we were art. That was the other fun part. <clears throat> Bob and I, Steve is writing the book, and Bob and I are are picking what chapters we're each going to research, and then we'd come up like on nanotechnology, and we'd be like, "Nanotech's mine." You're not <laughs> yeah, taking that. Nanotech, so, right? Yeah, we had a lot of those moments. Right, right, right. But it was, you know, the the book was a lot of fun to make because the content in the book is extraordinarily fun to us. That mm -hmm. that that's the key here. Yeah, but we like always. I think like our our. So, you know, we're science communicators and we operate in the skeptical sphere, right? So what does it mean to be a skeptic and a science enthusiast at the same time? It means we're really excited about science and technology. We're especially excited about the future of technology and the potential of what we're doing. Um, but at the same time, we want to to celebrate what's really real, right? Yeah. So we, we want to take a really harsh, critical eye towards it, but still be excited about the things right. that are happening and can be happening in the future. We, and we, I think we strike that balance. We strike that balance well. Oh yeah, we have to. That, that's, that's the sweet spot where we, where we try to land. And well, we try to keep each other honest too, because sometimes, you know, one of us might be more enthusiastic about yeah. the type of technology and the other ones have to say, yeah, but no, that's probably well, not going to happen. Those are our scientific sacred cows yeah and i think we're pretty damn at this point we're pretty damn aware of what our sacred cows are when it comes to science yeah there's, mm -hmm. there's certain technologies that we all know we really love and are rooting for right but as a skeptic we have to we eventually get to the point where we admit to ourselves okay you know we just yeah, taking a deep dive was really helpful to, to to go literally two or three layers deeper than we've really ever gone before that was and that was help there very are, there are some topics where like helpful. we flipped our opinion about yeah. the bottom line yeah right um there's a couple you'll read about it in the book if you got the book that there's some things we were like yeah we were pretty enthusiastic about and then when we did the the you know crunch the numbers and looked at the, the all of the practicality and things like this is never going to happen, is it? This is just yeah, never going to happen. Much less likely now, than we thought. We had to, to completely change our mind. And or, the flip. And the flip. And the flip the other way, yeah, too. It's exactly. like, well, this is going to be way more important than anybody has been talking about. Clearly, there are advantages here, which we think, you know, we're probably going to blow away, you know, anything that would be competing against it. Um, and I want to mention, because we, we got about six or seven minutes yeah. left before we take questions. Um, the... First off, you know, it, it's, it was doing the research it was a lot of work and it, it was totally worth it and everything. But we had all this information in our head and then we got to write some science fiction. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah, yeah. which I think is a great part of the book because we get to kind of celebrate like, what would it be like if nanotechnology was fully realized? Let's give you a paragraph or two of, of a very brief science fiction story about what it would be like to, to be in that world. Right. A glimpse of the future. Yeah. Yeah. Little yeah cool. Vignettes or. Yeah, because we have to do that, right? I mean, for fans it's not so much it's, <laughs> you know? it's not a prediction it's just a glimpse of a possible future depending yeah. on how things go um but again you know there's uh, some interviews we get asked not to anticipate too many of your questions but like 
what's this all for? Like, what if you can't really predict in detail, you know, anything beyond a short may, period of time? Make yeah your future. <laughs> well, there's a lot of things that this is. I think that this is extremely useful for. So, you know, first of all, there are some pretty reliable predictions you can make in the broad yep. brushstroke, and it's just a matter of when, not if. Yeah, it's, but a, it's a matter when. of when, or or exactly. Yeah, you know, we might not know exactly how we're going to get there, but we know some version of something is going to probably get us. Out. Like we know we're going to be moving out into space. We could argue about the best infrastructure for populating the solar system. There's lots of possibilities, but it, we know that that's happening. You know, for example, um, it's also you know there's the question of future shock, you know, it, it does um, help society, I think, prepare a little bit for the kinds of changes that might be just around the corner. Like we have to think about regulations for things like genetically modifying humans. Yeah. And we, you know, we have to think about that knowing what the potential of the technology is, or we're merging our brains with machines. It's happening. And there's no reason, no theoretical reason and no technical reason why we we can't get to a mature brain machine interface. And so we explore all of the implications of that. And that's important, I think, you know, for us to realize. Or, you know, I think a really solid example is right now we're trying to, you know, mitigate the worst, you know, aspects of global warming. We're trying to decarbonize our our industry and our energy infrastructure. You know, collectively, we're practicing futurism, right? We're thinking about what the future of technology right. is going to be for the next right. 20 or 30 years, how our decisions and investments will affect that. And you look, you can look at the history of technology and say, well, what was the, like, what were the most important things? Why did one technology win out over another? Oh, it looks like, you know, at the end of the day, infrastructure is usually the deciding factor. Yeah, it's a there. Huge factor. Not yeah. necessarily yeah. any inherent superiority of the technology. Right. So if we invest in the right infrastructure, everything else will flow from that. There, there's a philosophical thing yeah. that, that came out of writing this book that I, I really appreciate. And that is that we can't predict the future, but we we can make it. We craft the but, future with the decisions. Right, that we decisions make. that we make right now. Yeah. So that means like, you know, you know, like who do we vote into to office? Yeah. What kind of, you know, how are they investing that money? What, what are we backing as a society? You know, mm -hmm. like right now, like I'm feeling like we need to quadruple our efforts with green, you know, green mm. technology, right? We need sure. more solar panels, more wind, you know, wind power, all that stuff, you know, and we, and if we put the time and energy into it, 10, 15, 20 years down the road could be very different if we don't. Yeah. 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 So we make the future. Absolutely. Um, yeah. You know, collectively we make it through indiv billions of individual decisions. We make it through the, the politicians that we elect to represent us. We make those decisions through individuals who control key industries or key companies, um, you know, can have an outsized uh, influence on that. And then also shit happens, you know, yeah. that there are things outside of our control that are going to happen uh, that, you know, that will disrupt our plans. Yeah. Well, uh, look at, look at, um, you know, nuclear reactors. Yeah. You know, it got into the public consciousness that there's something bad about well, three, it. Yeah, three mile Island. I yeah. mean, that's, yeah. and people, you know, people are, are don't want it now. Yeah. We have Gen Four reactors right now that are freaking awesome. The, we have the designs for them, not the actual. Yeah, yeah. But that's what I. But, but the yeah. point is, we could be building them, and, and yeah. we're not because the population just feels scared about it, and it's not. Correct. Only now is people coming around. I think some people. Yeah, I think global warming is becoming scarier. Well, yeah. the, the yeah. whole thing with Russia is pushing. You know, yeah. everybody in yeah. Europe is dying for technology now. They're they're going to keep reactors on. I I I bet you that this leads to a Gen Four reactor coming online. Yeah, I mean there are. People like in China and South Korea that are working on it, and um, in the UK also, and also small modular reactors. Yes, things happen. The industry reacts. The public reacts. How does that play out? Again, we could talk about the science and the technology and what can happen, but we will collectively make decisions which will can kill certain industries, you know, elevate others to prominence. Um, yeah, you know, we like to talk about the segue didn't change how people get around. Why was that? Because, well, it required a lot of infrastructure that nobody was willing to build and people thought they looked dorky writing it. And but the technology was awesome. You know, it wasn't a technology problem. It was a usage problem, an infrastructure problem. Um, uh, so we, we should start taking some questions now. Yep. So we had, that's See a half hour. So um, 
we're very enthusiastic about this book. We always you know, love the opportunity to talk about it. We, again, we're just scratching the surface yeah. of all the chapters in the book. Uh, but we're, yeah, we're happy to take your questions. Yes. For everyone watching out there, uh, don't forget, if you have any questions you would like to pose, go ahead and put them under the Ask a Question section. All right. First question we have for you, gentlemen, is what was your favorite bit of research that didn't make it into the book? So, well, we decided on the chapters before we you know, did a lot of additional research. So we didn't waste you know, time doing research on stuff. But you know, if you're talking about what we researched, like after we couldn't update the book anymore, I think, you know, one was the fusion thing that was very impactful. Another one. So this is, you know, a, 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 something we reported on on our podcast, the SGU, you know, because we're talking about Oh, uh, you know, we're going to need a ton of batteries, not only if we're going to turn all of our cars into battery electric and we're going to get battery you know, grid storage. And, you know, a lot of people are saying, well, you got to choose one of those two, but we're not going to have enough lithium to make enough batteries for both of those things. And then there's a series of news items about um, like how much lithium there is in the world. And this is not something that I was able to really research prior to, you know, the, the book being finished. Turns out there's enough lithium in the ocean that we can extract from the ocean to meet our current annual needs of lithium Wait for, it. for about a million years. <laughs> know, right? oh, There's basically an unlimited supply of lithium in the world. Yeah. And I think by the time a million years rolls by, We'll, we'll be on to the next thing. Whatever. Yeah, yeah. So we basically, it's like, I didn't really, that's a non-problem. It's just a matter of how much does it cost. Yeah. And of course, if we, if, you know, the, if we need the batteries, the cost will be, will be worth it. Uh, there's also the, the mineral mo nodules in the ocean that has cobalt and nickel and all the other stuff we need. There are just sitting on the ocean floor in these potato sized nodules of metal. Um, you know, there's issues about making sure we can get them without disrupting the ecosystem, but I mean, it's it's actually not an issue, you know, just the the existence of the raw material. It's yeah. just a matter of the, right. the cost effectiveness of getting it. So, well, so for me, um, I wish we if we do a, a, a second edition or yeah. a sequel to this, I will have a chapter on mega scale engineering, uh, engineering in the in the far future and kind of mid future. Um, this is just engineering products that are just like off the hook. I mean, I'm talking Plant like, size. like, yeah, like say, uh, like Larry Niven's ring world where, you know, it's basically got the surface area of a million earths, you know, or or, around this, just, yeah. just kind of like the technology yeah. that is super advanced technology. Let's say, you know, Kardashev level two or three level technology, so you know, many times more advanced than we, you know, what could we do in centuries in the future? What kind of, what kind of engineering projects mm -hmm. could we do? Which ones are feasible? Which ones? are not feasible and that to me that's a fascinating discussion and uh i wish we had we devoted any time to it right. next time next the sequel the whatever the book was edition. already like twenty thousand words longer than yeah it was already yeah, it's right. <laughs> but just a fascinating idea these right. mega scale engineering projects all right let's move on to the next one yeah it doesn't sound like you will run out of any material whatsoever for more yeah. subsequent books <laughs> um what is one question that you have yet to find a satisfactory answer to? Uh, let's see. That's a well, I mean, in general, like I always feel like I want to know exactly where nanotechnology is today and what's what is the holdup? Yeah, I always there isn't so much a holdup as it's just really hard. You know, we're making very slow incremental advances, figuring out how to get machines to do what we want them to do, you know, at the nanoscale. I think that is an unanswered question about like what the ultimate potential of nanotechnology is. There's the enthusiasts who will just say, it'll be, you could do anything. You could turn a rubber tire into a stake or whatever. But I, I personally don't think that that's extremely plausible, at least not any time in the foreseeable future. You have to go to the really distant future to get to yeah, that I mean, crazy mature nanotech. But Like foglets, look, uh, look up the word foglet and uh we'll read about it in our book i'll read about it in the book <laughs> and uh and that's that's one extrapolation of mature nanotech that's just mind-blowing yeah but i think that that's a big unknown like where is it going to be in the 50 to 100 year zone because i could totally see nanotechnology simmering in the background and, and not bam. really having any practical applications beyond like some low-hanging fruit um for 100 years that wouldn't surprise me yeah. at all 
but we're hoping that right, next week that they right, have a there could be the killer them. app that you know that somebody makes a breakthrough. Right. It's like, oh, we could do this. It's like, and this really will completely you know put the uh, you know technology. Yeah, it's it's so behind. disruptive that you will often not come across it in science fiction because it just changes everything to such a degree that it's like they just don't even put it in the in the book. Um, it becomes similar. inaccessible. Like you yeah. can't even think about a world where you have that kind. It's of too disruptive. I mean, it's like artificial technology. superintelligence. It's such a yeah. game changer that you often, you know, you see like gimped AI or or AI is really not even mentioned in, in a lot of sci-fi because it's just which is way has way too much potential, especially when you get to that well, it's, it's, superintelligence it's very level. To like if if there were actually Star Trek teleporters, mm -hmm. you know, or transporters, if they were real. Life wouldn't be the way that they're yeah. doing it in that, right? Right, like, right. Like it's so transformative that we yeah, can't like even science, holodeck, science same fiction thing. often introduces disruptive technology and have it do one little thing. Yes. Like, yeah, but if you had the tech to do that, your the world would be very, very different. Here's another thing. There's one more thing on this question is artificial intelligence. Specifically, you know, if if we network a bunch of just narrow AI together. Is that it will will a general intelligence, a self-aware AI be just emerge out of that without us deliberately creating it? Oh I don't think we could really answer that question right now. Um, there's definitely philosophers who have different views on that. Um, that's a huge conversation. It's a huge conversation, but uh, that's I think in you know right now I suspect that it can, but. There's right. no way to prove it. We'll know it when we get there, you know. But I, I suspect at some point, you know, we'll we'll turn around and go, "Oh shit, we accidentally created, you know, a general intelligence." Actually, more specifically, we won't be able to tell. We will not be able to tell if it's self-aware or not. There won't be any way. It'll be it'll act exactly as if it is, but we won't know if it really is or if it's just a super good at mimicking being uh, intelligent, being actually sentient. And, and I, I I hope that we don't accidentally kill a bunch of conscious entities by like turning it off right? yeah yeah all right next question absolutely wow do you try to get through them oh no totally do each of you have a specific piece of technology that you're looking forward to or at least really hoping for oh yeah so i mean i'll start i think you know, for me it's the brain machine interface right to when we get to the point where you know you can be um seamlessly and thoroughly connected to a computer to the point, the matrix style, right? So that's basically when you know, the mature version of that is the matrix. It's so seamless and so powerful, you could confuse it for physical reality. Um, there are so many applications of that technology, uh, and it just creates so much, you know, possibilities and potential. Um, just the the ability to exist essentially as a god in a virtual yeah. world uh would be super fun if nothing else but i'm just there, super fun yeah i mean there are lots of <laughs> practical and medical applications yeah but the bottom but the gaming is going to be off the hook um no that's that's i think that's a transformative technology that exists and it's really yeah. nothing between us and the matrix but incremental advances at this point yeah. in time right, Bob, for me ahead. for me it's a it's a benign artificial super intelligence that's what one of the things i'm so hoping for it's a, i liken it to um a genie and you when you wish for more wishes that kind of thing that's like <laughs> never allowed because or if you create the artificial super intelligence one possibility that i'm looking for forward to is is the ability to then solve so many other problems climate change uh Cure, you know, curing cancer, you know, resources, uh, you know, entering a you know post scarcity society, all these big things that are so difficult to solve. This one technology could could then could then potentially develop it. Yeah. Uh, Can you, you know, do a do, thousand years of research in ten minutes? Oh yeah, yeah, sure. you know, yeah, yeah. Do a century's <laughs> worth of research over the weekend. That that kind of stuff. So for me, artificial superintelligence. I just hope we survive the transition. <laughs> um, and, but the, uh, you you threw in a very good word there, benign. A yes. benign, oh, yeah. super advanced AGI. Uh, without the benign aspect, um, it yeah. could be very pretty scary. And you know, in the book, uh, I'll point out that for a lot of the technologies, we talk about the utopian version yeah. of the far future of that technology and the dystopian yes. versions. Like, yeah, this could be really awesome. It could also destroy humanity, yeah, yeah, yeah. depending on which you know how things go. 
as technology gets more and more powerful, the stakes get higher and higher. Mm -hmm. right. uh, it gives us the power to create and destroy on a, in a more you know profound right. way. And that so exploring those possibilities too is is very interesting, but it could get very scary very if, quickly. If you want to read a really good sci-fi series about benign AIs, Neil Asher's Polity Universe, highly, highly recommended. Love it so much. All right, so my answer, I have two two answers very quick. On a fun level, I really want VR to be, I want to be able to be with people that I, you know, playing a game with yeah. people in VR where I could see their facial expressions and yeah. like have it be that immersive. Yeah. Or like kind of like yeah. the ability to be able to sit around a table and play Dungeons and Dragons in VR. So yeah. using the elements of VR, but still like having the experience of being with people, yeah. that yeah. would be fantastic. Longer term is really like something like CRISPR that can change the way we handle our biology to, to improve health, get rid of disease yeah. and, and all that, like mm -hmm. a, a super advanced or not even super, like, you know, just what's it going to be like in 50 years? That'll probably be it. And we can just say, okay, we have cancer. Don't worry about it anymore. Yeah. You know, we, we got it. Yeah. Got and, and AI can do that. All right. Next question. <laughs> all right. You mentioned predictions and what's next ah, and what's next stems from already existing technology. Would you say there's any current or somewhat recent technology that just came out of left field? Sure. Oh, let's see. What's the? Um, I mean, well, let's go way back, way back. That, yeah. That I'm aware of. I'm. I I remember reading that when sound record when Edison came out with sound recording, nobody saw that coming, and it's, it might sound weird, you know, yeah, to think that, but it's back. true that nobody anticipated it, nobody was thinking about it. Can you imagine having audio sound recording uh, come out of nowhere and never even thought thinking about it? Yeah. That. That's that was a surprise. Yeah, that yeah, surprised yeah. me. Changed a lot of nobody yeah. anticipated. They never never thought it was possible. But that's a long time ago. What's yeah, it, yeah. Well, I mean, the, the thing is, what's hard about that is, uh, you know, when you investigate uh, the, any technology, and, the, and again, not just the ones that are that we talk about in the book, because you know, any any science news item, I often will go, what was, when did was this first discovered or first thought about? Yeah, or, good luck. And it always goes back way deeper than you think, way deeper. Mm. Um, you know, they were using steam power 2000 years ago. They just never thought to do it, use it to do stuff, you know, to do, to do work. They were, they made yeah, toys. Like a toys. They, yeah, made, they toys. made toys. And for me, Steve, I remember doing research on rocket technology and I wanted to get, I wanted to hand it, put in my research notes, the first real example of rocket technology. And I remember I sent Steve a thing saying, here, this is it. And then I did more research. No, no, here, this, this one was, oh no, this one was, it kept yeah. going back and back. It wasn't yeah, yeah, yeah. easy to find that first, first instance. But you think of things like CRISPR, like CRISPR might seem like one of those technologies, but actually it goes back to about 30 or 40 years but ago. They didn't do, it, you it, know, it, that kind of technology. You it know? started, I think, in the 80s when mm -hmm. they, they first started researching it, but they didn't do much with it. Like the, the innovation no, no, but that happened. There's this recently, long really... wind up, there's this research yeah. happening in the background. So to the lay consciousness, it comes out of nowhere. But if you're paying attention or if you look back, it didn't come out of nowhere. Yeah. yeah. It was. There's a long history before it gets it crosses that line, or like now there's monoclonal antibody therapies for everything. It seems like, but I actually first heard about them 30 years ago, and it actually goes back a little bit longer than that. How about 3D printing? 3D printing 80s, but, but 80s, but it had a it had a definitely demarcation line. It crosses a line, and that's the left field thing. But real again, it's always at least 10, Critical 20, mass. 30 years, be, yeah. yeah, you know, back. Um, how about um. Uh, reusability with space vehicles you know that's 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 new that was a good breakthrough yeah yeah uh, i'm not sure how much that was talked about previously it was sort of anticipated in science fiction like most science fiction vessels are reusable it just took a company to put the money into it to do it you know what i mean yeah, but, to it, crack but it. It, it did come it did come yeah. like pretty suddenly all right let's we i think we have one more so let's let's get to it before we have to are we going till till 10 i think we have till a quarter of okay all right, we got uh, two more questions. Um, All righty. Yeah, you don't, you'll definitely make it to them. Uh, next one, referencing popular sci-fi books and movies, has there been any technology that you'd say is the most achievable in the next century? Uh, let's see. Um... The next century. I mean, we talk about the we talk about I think all the technology things we think are achievable in the next century, like fusion. I think we'll get in the next century. Again, 
brain machine interface. That's true artificial fairly, intelligence, artificial AI, generals, sure. Within a hundred years. Flying sure. cars, flying cars. Uh, autonomous, flying cars. Autonomous cars are good. Autonomous definitely. vehicles. Yeah, there's, they, lot, there's lots of stuff. Yeah, they, they always take long. a little bit longer than you think, but um, like, which is one of the, the you know, futures and fallacies. People tend to overestimate short-term progress and underestimate long-term progress. So you think, yeah, that's going to be around in 10 or 20 years. It's probably going to be 30 or 40, but then it'll be cooler than you think. And then it'll go even beyond, you know, what you yeah. think is generally what happens. Like uh, self-driving cars, autonomous vehicles, pretty much, you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, people were predicting that we would have them by 2020. Mm -hmm. And it didn't quite work out that way because it turned out that last 5% was a lot harder than everybody thought. And, and that, uh, that tacked on another 10 to 20 years before it's really going to be street viable, you know. Uh, but that's but it's common clear, though. The last it's, 5%. It's a that common That last 5% that's a that happened theme. with speech recognition. Even yeah, Kurzweil yeah. himself yeah. said, oh, well, this is going to happen and whatever, this many years. And it turned out that last 5% was hard. And it made all the difference because if one in 20 words is wrong, it kind of sucks. Yeah, yeah it still yeah. sucks. But, uh, and if, you know, it, it, with driving cars, self-driving cars, that could be fatal, that last 5%. Yeah. So uh, we really have to have to get there. So I think that that technology, we thought it was going to be a 2020s technology. It's probably going to be more like a 2030s, maybe even 40s technology. But definitely, yeah, with, you know, I think by 2050, we're going to have, fully self-driving cars as we all you know hoped and wished we were going to have well and again flying cars too again that's one of the one of those 20 years away and always will be technologies but basically we have them now they're just drones and, you know yeah, yeah we, the, the technology is all there it's just a matter of efficiency i mean yeah you know? like but that moment when somebody is actually flying in the car yeah. and doing it like that hasn't happened yet we, we yeah. want we want that where it's it's starting yeah. to actually get but so there. again what what happens is it's like you hear about it you anticipate it, it doesn't come, you get frustrated, you forget about it, I mean collectively, and then suddenly it hits, you turn around, it's like everyone's flying cars. Yeah. It'll be, that was the smartphone for me, right? Yeah. You know, we anticipated yeah, right. it in the 80s, we sort of saw some early versions of it in the early 90s, and, but, you know, it never, they weren't there, they were disappointing, and then 2007, Apple comes out with the iPhone, and then Everyone, it seemed like everyone instantly had one and the world was never the same. Yeah. And, and it just happened. How did we get along quickly. without him? I mean, and now it's like, yeah, like what, my best friend in the world. Oh, don't would be, even, Bob. The, that's the precious. Oh. Um, All right, let's yeah. move on. All right. Next question. One more. Please. Final question. <laughs> All right. Last question. One of my favorites. What are some of your favorite unrealistic technologies that, sh uh, that are shown in pop culture? For example, like the Jetsons or Futurama. I mean, faster than light travel. I mean, yeah, that's that's a, that's a big one. FTL. It's such a it's such a convenient and almost necessary plot device that you know so many uh, yeah, it's, science fiction it's ubiquitous you know, works will throw that in there. But it's probable. It's one of those. Yeah, probably never going to happen. Like we'd have to stronger than probably really be missing something fundamental about the laws of the universe for that to be possible. So uh, I wouldn't bet on it. All right, what's that's, mine? What's that's mine? A big you guys, one. you guys should be able to know what mine is. Uh, does it have something to do with meatballs? No. No. Um, binary star systems? Well, you're close. You're in the right, you're in the right ballpark. Blasters. Blasters. Oh, of right. course. Blasters. Of course. Blasters are plausible. We talked about They're that. They're plausible. We don't we're not gonna have one soon. I mean, I, I I don't know. That's not that's one of those ones that's not as hard as you as you would think because it really is just creating a ball of plasma and shooting it. It's which is not that hard. We could make plasma now. It just takes a lot of energy. Yeah, yeah that's it just takes a lot of energy. Technology. I mean, having it in a in a pistol, sure, that that's probably going to be a while. It's the energy source. It's not the the basic idea of it, though. A lightsaber, however, probably Forget never going to happen. About it. Yeah. Right. Those are we we do a deep dive on that. There's there's you know you could sort of kind of make one, but it's you know the the energy demands are off the hook and there's some significant practical limitations again and if we do make one you're not going to be seeing it in a lightsaber know, right? you're going to be that, seeing that it a power some, source running a, a building you know, that requires some disruptive technology but there's a lot of things that like the jetsons type futurists imagined that i don't think are ever going to happen like i don't think we're going to ever be eating pills you know for food you know why would we? Um, your car will never turn into a briefcase. Your car is never going to turn into a briefcase. <laughs> yeah. um, probably. I don't know. Origami style cars. Yeah. 
Hey, you never know. All right, we gotta we gotta close it out. So do we? Yes. Yeah. Oh we do. boy. All right. Okay. okay. Oh my gosh. Fun. Thank you. This was really fun. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, it's a lot of the science stuff that we as you know, often science fiction readers and enjoyers really don't think about, except for those few who are probably scientists who are reading through books going, this is unreachable or, or whatever. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. thank you for being here. Everyone out there, don't forget, uh, you can get your own copy of The Skeptic's Guide to the Future with Mysterious Galaxy. We still have some signed book plates if you would like to get those with your order. We ship across the country, including outside the country to most most countries, you know, some of the weird ones with weird, uh, you know, uh, things going on like the eu right now <laughs> right. hi melissa all right, all right everyone have Thanks a good night guys bye good night. bye